Excellencies, distinguished academicians, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I wish to thank Archbishop Sanchez Sorondo for the kind invitation to offer some brief remarks at the opening session of the technical workshop on food safety and healthy diets, a theme of great importance for the Holy See and dear to Pope Francis. With the hope of fostering dialogue and identifying some possible areas of action from a Christian perspective, my remarks will touch upon three fundamental points. First, the human right to food and the meaning of healthy eating, which is a more robust term than healthy food because it takes into account the human and cultural aspects of the issue. Secondly, the global food situation with its repercussions on our lives as citizens, consumers, entrepreneurs, workers, scholars, and also believers. And thirdly, and finally, the positive signs and concerns observed, as well as areas of further interest and action. So first, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Article 25 of the Declaration. This affirms that every human being, regardless of the particular circumstances, should be protected and defended in their fundamental human rights. However, does this responsibility to provide food in order to enjoy a decent living, as in the case with clothing, accommodation, medical care, coincide with a right to healthy eating? Or is it only part of that right? According to the most recent positions on the subject, both the right to provide food and therefore to be free from hunger, food security, and the right to an adequate diet in terms of nutrition, food safety, are interconnected. In this context, we are dealing with a set of conditions that should allow each person to have access at all times to adequate and safe nutrition and to those means necessary for their livelihood. This guarantee must be provided in ways that respect human dignity, different cultures and traditions, as well as the environment and its resources. However, a quick look at the global scene shows an unfortunate reality. Too many continue to die from hunger and suffer from malnutrition. The lack of healthy and nutritious food stunts growth and impedes physical development. Thus, the question may be asked, how is it that there is not yet any guarantee for this right? In the search for a response, we should take into consideration the evolution of the understanding of the human right to adequate and safe food, starting from the initial reference to food inserted in the more general provision of the right to a decent standard of living, as indicated in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Over the last 70 years, the idea has gradually progressed that nutrition does not depend solely on production, a quantitative approach, which is not sufficient to ensure a good level of food availability and wholesomeness. Adequate and safe food is dependent also on other factors linked to health, politics, education, culture, and environmental and climate issues. In fact, in order to guarantee the human right to adequate and safe food, we need an effective availability of healthy food, compatible with the culture of those who consume it, as well as an amount sufficient for the nutritional needs of people, groups, and communities. This means to promote access to food, taking into consideration the supply side and the demand side of the whole distribution food chain. The connection with other rights is evident, confirming the principle of interdependence and interrelationship between human rights. In order to ensure healthy diets, states and those working in the sector should not be concerned only with obligations of conduct, but also other interweaving responsibilities, 
respect for the person and the responsible use of resources, protection of the person with regard to food safety, with the prohibition of the use of harmful substances in food, facilitating access to food and therefore favorable socio-economic conditions. At the root of the implementation of the aforementioned obligations and responsibilities lies the full participation and inclusion of each person in society on the basis of the principle of subsidiarity, food safety, and healthy diets cannot be fully guaranteed without a process of identification, education, and awareness. Secondly, according to official estimates, over 800 million people worldwide suffer from chronic hunger. That is, they do not regularly have enough food to leave an active life. This figure is slightly lower than the 868 million people registered in the period 2010 to 2012, as well as a decrease of 17% compared to the two years, 90, the two years 1990 to 1992, since when the world population has almost doubled. The data tell us that something has changed for the better. Nevertheless, it is not enough. The levels of nutrition in the world are strongly influenced not only by the availability of food, but also by the diets and the food regulations adopted. The number of malnourished in the world is approaching 2 billion. Paradoxically, the conditions of hunger are counterbalanced by the risks connected to obesity and the effects of non-communicable diet, diet diseases related to a bad diet that leads to overweight problems. Many countries are trying to address malnutrition, which has impact also on the workplace. Hunger and obesity prevent work with considerable economic losses, as well as on health costs. These two aspects, especially in developing countries, could prove to be dramatic. According to the indications of FAO and WHO, emerged in the second World Conference on Nutrition in November 2014. Basically, looking at the current situation, it becomes clear that while the elimination of hunger was the preeminent difficulty of the past, today we're also facing a challenge that concerns insufficient nutrition in terms of calories and micronutrients, which is shown to be connected to hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. Moreover, as is known, the lack of healthy food is tied to the lack of access to the food market that is conditioned by the increase in prices, which is not explained solely by production problems. The world production today is able to feed a global population well over 7 billion people, or by environmental factors, but also by market speculation. We saw this in the crisis that started in 2007. Profitability and speculation have made food a commodity like any other, obfuscating the intrinsic value that has always been attributed to food because of its direct relationship with human life, as indicated by Pope Francis at the Second International Conference on Nutrition in 2014. Of course, while considering the efforts needed to guarantee healthy eating, we should not forget the effects of conflicts, natural disasters, and events determined by human behavior, as well as the fundamental management of the precious resource of water. Although the picture is alarming for the paradoxes it presents, we must not abandon hope. As Pope Francis says, this does not take away the certainty that change is possible. And we are here in this workshop to try to understand how to make this change happen. To make a difference, it will require awareness and the engagement of each similar to what happened and continues to happen with the preparation of the protection of our common house. Thirdly, is all of this an unrealistic utopian ideal? Supporting the development of various regions as a whole has produced considerable progress, but the achievement of SDG 2 focused on eliminating hunger is still not accomplished. What will this require? There are many paths. One is to promote access for small farmers and agricultural families to land and to the services necessary for the production, marketing, and use of agricultural resources. 
This point touches on various concerns, such as reform of farm policies, land ownership by women, and the prevention of land grabbing, a phenomenon that has become widespread, raising questions not only of foreign sovereignty, but of sovereignty to core. On the level of policymaking, an improvement in production yields is necessary. For example, by using more resistant seeds that are appropriate to local conditions and new cultivation techniques. There is also need for an increase in arable land, which includes not only actions to avoid environmental degradation, but an involvement of the poorest urban populations through the cultivation of small gardens. Moreover, on the ethical and anthropological level, a level of production that fails to satisfy fairly the growing demands, in fact, cannot forget that about 800 million people in the world do not have access to land. The answer, therefore, is not only in terms of production, but also in strengthening the resilience of populations and agricultural land in case of drought or other factors that put food security at risk. It is important that concerned communities directly manage the necessary measures and assume their share of responsibility and consequent action. There are several strategies that we can take into account, like the ones based on small investments and family farming using services such as microcredit. It is also urgent to work against food waste and bad management in the production, distribution and consumption chain of the food chain. For this perspective, it is fundamental to adopt and implement effective educational measures to counter food waste in the entire food chain. Looking to the future, in the medium and long term, it emerges that the planet's food security can be guaranteed if there will be the overall increase of agriculture productivity, improving the efficiency of farmland, food waste reduction, the implementation of good food regulations and the adoption of dietary regimes compatible with cultures and environmental conditions linked to local production. There are some good practices aimed also at respecting the dignity of farmers and those living in rural areas. I would like to conclude with a couple of poignant thoughts from Pope Francis. In Evangelium Gaudium, he remarked, we are scandalized because we know that there is enough food for everyone and that hunger is the result of a poor distribution of goods and income. The problem is made worse by the generalized practice of wastefulness. The Holy Father motivates our efforts, pointing out that we are not simply talking about ins ensuring nourishment or a dignified sustenance for all people, but also their general temporal welfare and prosperity. I wish every success to this initiative, which demonstrates how the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences is not only a forum for reflection and study, but also for formulating concrete proposals for the good of the human family. And I thank you for your kind attention.